please uh, uh, welcome uh, Mr. Pete Cooper, who will give us an overview of the Starshot system, uh, as well as, the, in fact, the entire Breakthrough Initiative. Pete. Thanks, Jim. Um, thanks for all you guys coming, and uh, thanks, Les, for setting this up. Uh, I think it's really important that we, uh, that we do pull together, and we do have, uh, we stop the fractionization of the, uh, of the, of the groups, and th that we all kind of pull them together. Uh, Starshot will try and uh, do our bit to, to focus, so we have a focused applied effort for the entire uh, uh, journey to the stars, because it's gonna take all of us to get there, because it is a really, really hard, hard problem. Um, Dr. Warden sends his apologies. He did get called away to Luxembourg uh, at the last minute. Um, he was planning to be here, but um, he couldn't make it. So I'll, uh, I'd like to start with a, uh, a video. We paid a lot of money for this video, so you should like it, I hope. <laughs> We are here. This is home. But for most of our history, we knew only our cradle in the corner. We awakened on this tiny world beneath the blanket of stars, without a note to explain where we come from, who we are. We inhabited a tiny universe, oblivious to the rest of the cosmos. It was only four centuries ago that we began to use science to reveal nature's secrets and her laws. What is science? It's an epic journey of discovery. It's a continuity of minds. It's standing on the shoulders of the giants who came before us, looking out across a valley, over a hill, up to the sky, and asking, I wonder what's there. Oh, that view is tremendous. It allowed us to look across space and time. See the scale of the universe. And our place in it. We now know that our galaxy alone holds hundreds of billions of stars. And that the visible universe contains at least a hundred billion galaxies. In the last decade, we have discovered over 2,000 planets beyond our solar system. It's now estimated that there are tens of billions of habitable planets in our galaxy alone. Are we content to gaze at all these stars, all these worlds, from afar? We have taken to the sky. We have stepped off the earth. We have walked on the moon. We have landed on planets and comets. And ventured to the edge of deep space. Where now? It is uh, quite an impressive uh, video. I, I do like it, um, and we are <laughs> we are very close. Um, it occurs to me, uh, looking around the room, that uh, we do have a lot of uh, Starshot uh, leadership here. Of course, you've already met uh, Jim. There's also uh, Phil Lubin in the back, uh, Phil, and um, Bob Fugate in the front row, and. Kevin uh, Parkin, also. These are, these are principles, all principles in, the, uh, in our effort, in our Starshot effort. Um, so over the next few days while you're here, if you have questions, please uh, ask them. They're the smart guys. They know, uh, they know all the right answers. Um, the slides, please. 
Also, if uh, our email addresses are down there at the bottom, Warden's is um, this is Warden's and uh, this is mine. Um, I recommend uh, if please. Uh, I also have cards. If you hit me up for a card, I'll give you one. It has address on there too. Um, please, we want to have uh, interchange with folks. We want to be. We want to. We want to talk to people and find out uh, where the good ideas are and uh, make sure we uh, can include them in uh, in everything. And I guess these slides will be in the in the presentation. Yeah, in the proceedings. Yeah, so so they'll be there. Um, so I'll quickly uh, look at, I'll quickly go th through these slides. The Breakthrough Foundation has got two groups. One group is the prize. The prize is um, a uh, $3 million given to, in seven categories, about 12, 12 people a year uh, receive it. And it's funded by uh, the group of people here at the top, um, very, uh, they're very wealthy individuals in Silicon Valley. Um, the uh, intellectual leader of, of this is really uh, Yuri Milner. He's, uh, he's the one that uh, gives us the inspiration. Uh, the prize is given out at Ames uh, in November timeframe. Um, and, they, and, and it's trying to make science popular. It's trying to popularize uh, technology in, in the world. Um, and uh, there's another prize that uh, people don't don't really hear about and I would like to to solicit your guys help in trying to spread the word about it it's called the junior prize it's a uh, uh, it's a scholarship given to students from all over the world what they have to do is they have to make a, a five-minute video on some science or technology item and What's awarded is a $250,000 prize as a scholarship to the students, and then $100,000 given to um, uh, the school for a lab, and $50,000 given to the teacher. Um, this uh, prize, it, it just closed last week, so you missed it last week, but if you know anybody who's 16 to 20 years old, um, please uh, tell them about this. They might be interested. They might. Uh, be able to win it. Here's, uh, we actually awarded two. We couldn't decide on which one uh, uh, to pick. Um, so last year, these are the two ladies that won, uh, one from Peru and one from Singapore. Um, they're very interesting to watch uh, the videos online. That's just at uh, uh, Breakthrough Junior Prize. Um, so I, I would encourage it. So uh, the, the question is philanthropy in space. Why, why, sh why should, you know, for the last 50 years, all the space has been uh, dominated by large companies or large uh, countries, uh, which, is a, which is true. But if you go back 100 years, you'll find that most of the, uh, most of the space stuff, for instance, uh, Goddard here, was supported by uh, philanthropic folks. And what we seem to forget is that when they went to the North Pole, when they went to the South Pole, those were all funded by what you might call Kickstarters, what we would call today Kickstarter type campaigns, plus some uh, large foundations. Um, so there is a rich history of, of folks finding money in, in rather unusual places. Um, and, and Breakthrough Initiatives is, is our effort to do that. Again, this is a picture of Yuri Milner. Um, and, and the basic question that we're trying to answer is, where is everybody? It's the Fermi's paradox. Um, there's all kinds of answers, uh, uh, many of them very interesting. Uh, and, and we've divided the work in uh, the Breakthrough Foundation into five different tracks, and I'll talk briefly about a few of them. The first track that we started was Listen, which we started two years ago. Um, and we're, uh, we're partnering with Berkeley and CSRO and uh, the SETI organization, SETI at Home. And what we do is we rent uh, four hours a day on uh, the Green Bank Telescope, four hours a day on the Parks Telescope. <laughs> 
Green Bank is in, West Virginia Parks is in Australia. That gives us coverage on, on both. And then we also uh, rent about six hours a night on the Automatic Planet Finder uh, telescope at, uh, in California. We have some arrangements with the, uh, the FAST telescope, the 500 meter telescope in China. And we're starting discussions with some friends uh, in, a, in a wide field uh, telescope in uh, Ireland. Our goal is to look at a million stars, uh, the galactic center, and the 100 nearest galaxies, and, and try and um, try and, I don't want to say, well, try and professionalize, try and uh, define what, the, uh, what we see and what we don't see. There are so many, there have been a lot of searches out there, but they, they haven't really established what the threshold of where there are no, uh, no signals coming from and would like to do that. Currently, we're collecting two petabytes of data a day, um, and we're washing through there and looking for signals, and basically one day of, of listen is equal to a year of all the previous searches. Like I said, there's been five previous searches, um, and this is, uh, uh, most of them have only been down in the, the one to four gigahertz uh, range, um, and they haven't actually measured much of the sky, so uh, Jill Tarter's idea about taking a glass full of water out of, the, out of the sea and not seeing any fish doesn't mean there aren't any fish in the sea. Um, we also have an effort to talk about, this, this is a, a message that was sent uh, from Arecibo by Frank Drake and, uh, in the 70s, and we have a group that's looking at, well, okay, if we hear a message, what message do we send back? Um, should we send back a message? Um, Okay, I'll briefly also talk about WATCH. WATCH is looking for stars within five parsecs of the Earth, um, and our current target is uh, Proxima Centauri or Alpha Centauri A and B. Um, here's a graphical representation. The thing that always amazes me about this picture here is what are the chances that the sun that the closest stars to the sun are one that's slightly larger and one that's slightly smaller? Than our current uh, than our current sun, considering that 60, per, 60 to 80 percent of the stars in this local area of the galaxy are are red dwarfs, it's actually quite amazing. Um, here's a here's a picture of the closest five parsecs. Um, the colors are are the temperatures of the stars, and we're you you can see this is this is range north and south, and you can see there's, and the circle size, the size of the circle shows the, uh, uh, the size of the planet, the planet would be if it was in the habitable zone around those stars. And you can see that, that there are, that Alpha, Alpha Sen is a, a unique target that's close by and is large. So um, it's, we're really lucky that we have Alpha Centauri A and B, actually. So we're in um, Breakthrough Watch. We're uh, funding uh, uh, an instrument on the VLT. We're working with instruments on um, with instruments on Gemini and Magellan, and we're also doing a study, an ast astrometry study, for a space-based uh, telescope. Uh, to actually make an image of it. And here's some uh, artists, well, th these are computer models of what, uh, what it might look like if we actually find a planet. Um, so we're limited to, uh, we've limited our search to five parsecs, because 15 light years, because we, we feel that if you're gonna have a conversation with somebody, if it's 15 years one way, 30 years round trip, that's probably close to the limit of what you'd be able to sustain. Anything longer than that is uh, probably undoable. So we consider this our, uh, our target area. There are only 10, -like, 10 sun-like stars, 46 red dwarfs. We're not really sure how many brown dwarfs. Um, but that's really our target list. It's not many, I, I, I suppose. Uh, 
So we've, they've already found a, plant, a habitable planet around uh, Proxima Centauri, and this is, this is the guy that did it, um, Gillum, uh, out of ESO. Uh, he, he went and he looked through, he didn't actually do a new campaign, he went and he looked through data that was already there. Um, and by the way, this is, uh, that's Pete Warden, so uh, if you see him in the airport, you can yell at him. And this is, and this is Tim Dezo. He's, uh, he's the head of ESO. Um, uh, uh, artist concept of what it might look like on, on Proxima A. Another thing we're doing in um, uh, WATCH is Enceladus, because we're looking for life in the universe, and the solar system is part of the universe. Um, and we looked at all the different water worlds that are, are in our uh, solar system, uh, and we considered all the, uh, th these are the craft that have all gone past Jupiter. There's not really a, a whole lot of them. Um, but Enceladus is an interesting place. Uh, it has these large geysers that uh, are 150 kilometers tall, um, and they seem to be spewing out uh, hydrogen-rich um, salty water, uh, which is really quite unusual and, uh, and, and suggests that there might be some kind of uh, thermal vents, volcanic vents down at the bottom, um, caused by the, uh, the moon orbiting, orbiting uh, Saturn. And these, there might be enough energy there for uh, life to exist, so uh, we're studying uh, we're studying whether or not we can go and take a sample. The, the, uh, there are five, four uh, tiger stripes with each one of these circles as a vent. Um, and this red line is how Cassini went past it and what they, uh, uh, what they explored. The, the idea we had was uh, get on a big rocket and put a very small, uh, 10 very small CubeSat-like uh, objects on it and, uh, and fly by. Um, Here's some uh, payloads. The different types of payloads are mass spectrometers, uh, the uh, UV cameras, vis cameras, spectrometers, and chemical analyzers. Um, the, the problem is the plume uh, comes and it goes, and so you've got to hit it during the, where these red circles are. So it's about every three years there's an opportunity to, uh, to have the richest. Here's uh, just a... Uh, a representation of the planet, it's, or the moon, um, it's a very interesting place. But now uh, what we really want to talk about, which is Starshot, which is something that you'll hear quite a bit about. Um, and the question is, is there a Moore's Law for speed? Um, if, you, if you chart it from about 1850 on, up till about 1980, it seems to follow the curve but then somebody didn't make an invention they were supposed to make. And uh, I don't know which propulsion guy it was, but Huntsville is noted for propulsion, right? <laughs> so maybe it's somebody around here. So we need to have a uh, Helos 2, up until uh, the Juno mission, Helos 2 was the, the fastest object, and it was 1976. It was uh, 70 kilometers a second. Um, and so how, fa how, how long is it going to take us to get past that, uh, that, that barrier that we've seen? Uh, the rocket equation is really hard. Um, it really says that your ISP is what, what drives you. Um, and in order to get to percentages of, of light speed, we really need to, uh, would like to get close to a million ISP, which right now we're at about 200. So, um, this guy is two to three hundred. That's a long way from a million. Um, even the uh, atomic rockets, the nuclear and uh, the fission guys, um, don't quite make it. Um, antimatter comes close, but it turns out we need a thousand years production of antimatter to get us to to get us to the nearest star. So a thousand years of antimatter of the human production of antimatter is probably out of the reach. Um, there are some, I'll call them far-reaching uh, approaches. Um, 
fusion. These guys have come up with a, a concept of uh, a fusion that uh, that might work. But if this if these guys actually crack that nut, um, we're going to have Mr. Fusions in the back of all our cars, so we're not going to have to worry about energy again. Um, so that'll be th that'd be positive, but um, it's a bit far-reaching. Um, then you also have uh, people like Sonny White working on things that we really can't, we really don't understand yet, and so it's difficult to understand how to apply things we don't really understand. Um, so that really leaves us with one thing w with sailing, sailing on photons. Um, it was first proposed by uh, Kepler back in 1610 um, in his letter to Galileo. And so it has a long history of, uh, of, of working. And we also have uh, some very recent uh, examples of people sailing on, uh, um, sailing on solar winds. Uh, here's a, a brief uh, roadmap of where we're of where we're planning on going, and I guess uh, what what we basically say is right now we're doing uh, basic development, and then we're going to go into the research phase phase in about five years, and then into the production phase, and uh, to get to to twenty percent the uh, speed of light. But you can see our even our time horizons are with launches out in the twenty forties. Um, we have a lot of challenges, um, and we've listed them, and they're, they're on our website. Um, and we've been working on the challenges, and what we're focused on right now are the sail and the laser, and also communications. So those are our three thrusts for the next five years. Um, uh, we're about to release an RFP to, to go on the, uh, on the laser area trying to combine an infinite number of lasers um, into, into one machine and um, in about uh, sometime in, in the late winter of this, this year we're going to release the uh, sale RFP and then the communication RFP is going to come out in the, uh, in the, in the spring summer. Um, could we play the other video? So those, uh, the RFP that, that's coming out uh, on Friday is for combining the infinite number of lasers. Um, we're really looking for ideas about people who can coherently combine two trillion lasers. Um, it's a small number. Yeah, a piece of cake. So um, this is an artist rendition of the, of, of the array. This is what we call the mothership, and then there's the sail. Um, we have it, uh, this targeted in a place in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, this is supposed to be at least a kilometer by a kilometer. Some people think it should be five kilometers across, so it's a pretty big thing. It only shoots for two minutes because there are um, a lot of star or a lot of uh, spacecraft in orbit that it could hit, and this is a pretty bright beam, so it could damage them. Uh, so it, it hits the sail for two minutes, and then it flies for uh, 20 years. And it, it goes on, edge on so that it has minimum exposure to the uh, dust in the interstellar media. Um, and the artist even put a little bit of, uh, uh, of speed of light sort of drag there. And then somehow it magically slows down by the artist. The artist had it slow down here. I don't know how that happens. but. We basically have 10 seconds to take pictures. So we travel for 20 years. We have 10 seconds to take pictures um, to be within uh, one AU of, uh, close to one AU of, of the planet. And then we uh, use lasers and send back uh, the comms back with a, uh, a large laser pulse to the Earth and use the um, same array as a receive array. Um, to, uh, to, to get the message. Maybe you could play that one more time, just because it does go there pretty quick. So again, these, these are supposed to be lasers, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, it worked okay. Um, 
But again, there, there's the, uh, the lasers, and we think that the field of uh, regard of the lasers are probably going to be in degrees, not like it was shown there. Um, another big problem, it's 100 gigawatts of power developed, 50 gig, 30 to 50 gigawatts on the sale itself, depending on what assumptions you make. So doing that out in the middle of uh, the desert in Chile is also quite a challenge. Um, this, there, and it was a good point about what Les made when he kicked this off. If we're going to launch in uh, 2043, we get the signal back in 2067. Um, what can we do now? I mean, 20 years ago, I was taking pictures with a, a Kodachrome, right? Uh, th th then I moved. Then I moved to uh, to video cameras. I can't even find a VHS around, let alone a Beta. Uh, how am I? And then we went to DV DVRs. Uh, how am I going? How are we even going to draw a straight line with keeping the data together, let alone having it be relevant to to folks? So I think that's a uh, it's a very big question that. Um, that's hard to answer, and, and also I would also argue that we live in the Facebook world, and, and in the Facebook world, there are people that can spend an afternoon, Sunday afternoon, uh, on this problem, and if we, could, if we could present them a problem that they could work on, some kid in Mumbai or, or Beijing or someplace, if we could set it up so that they could electronically contribute, I think that's gonna, help us uh, solve these problems. Um, and, but I think that's, that's a huge, you know, for an old guy like me trying to figure out Facebook, I don't know, um, let alone coming up with an engineering solution or an engineering way to have that interchange, uh, we're working on it. Um, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see, there we go. So we certainly can't send a big spacecraft like this on a, on a journey like we just showed. 7,000 kilos is not going to work. We have to, we have to uh, come up with these uh, little guys. Um, and uh, this, this kind of gives you an idea of how little they are. Um, it's 200, 200 milligrams, and it has, it has a laser. It has... It has much of the functionality that uh, we need laser, processor, memory, uh, photon engines um, for steering. Um, and we were able to launch uh, six of these on uh, this year on, the, uh, on a PSLV. Um, and we, three of them got trapped inside a non-functioning spacecraft, but three of them were released and We've been talking, we talked to them until they deorbited. They were in a very low orbit, so uh, they didn't stay, stay up well. But, but this basically has the same functionality. Th this thing here has the same functionality as, this 200 milligrams has the same functionality as the, uh, um, as a Sputnik. Um, so, so it's, we've come a long way. Um, okay, so if you have the, if you have the chip, and you have the sail, uh, we call that uh, the Starship plus the sail, we call the nanocraft. Um, so our initial, we, we talked about this, the uh, laser device development, uh, RFP release on Friday, um, sail development RFP released in February, and laser communication uh, sometime in the summer. Uh, we're also looking at, so we're thinking about, um, we're, we're thinking about experiments we can do in the near term. What are the things that we can do now to keep the people excited and keep, uh, um, keep people interested? And so one of those things we thought about is if we were able to develop, it seems like the materials are being developed quicker than uh, the laser technology. And we may be in a position in, in 10 years to have a, um, to, to have a sail, sail material with the, with the correct aerial density to be able to um, 
visit some of the uh, some of the planets in our solar system. So some of the things we've been thinking about is if you dive down to very close to the sun, much closer than uh, Mercury, uh, you can get uh, accelerations and you can go out, you can make it to, uh, to, to Jupiter in months, to Pluto in, in less than a year. Um, so it's an, it's an incredible thing that you might be able to investigate all of, uh, all of the solar system for uh, very low cost. Um, Here's some of the uh, some of the times, and uh, the other part that we need to that we also think about this that always that I'm always worried about is we have we understand really well up out to Pluto, but what's going on in the interstellar media is uh, less than obvious to us, and and yet we need to build a, a vehicle that's going to be able to survive that that trip. So. Um, we need a lot of work in that area. Um, I have a few minutes for some questions. Um, I'd like to see if anybody's paying attention. Um, or uh, I noticed in the, in the study projects we're, 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 we're pointing the, uh, the uh, parabolic dish antenna out in different directions. And uh, some suggestion has been made that we, the signal might be there by a broadband kind of transmission, or it might, uh, uh, the signal might come from multiple directions at once. That we have the means to find so the question is, could we have a broadband uh, approach to SETI uh, to look across the whole sky? Andrew Simeon will be here uh, and talk tomorrow, I think. and. Um, you should really ask him, but there are we are doing studies into uh, how to actually do that with um, with some of the new telescopes that uh, the square kilometer array that's coming online down in uh, uh, South Africa. So yes, we are trying to figure out how to to get these wideband signals. We are looking at it. Just okay. talk about I'll repeat the your uh, sun grazer is a fascinating concept. It doesn't really seem necessary to wait twenty years or ten years to start testing that concept. So how ambitious should we be? Well, right now we can make a uh, square centimeter size material for, uh, that, that has the aerial densities that we need. Um, we need something that's square meters. So how fast we can, we can expand the, that material is really a question. And, that, and that's what we hope to answer with the uh, with the RFPs in, uh, uh, for the sale. So the concept is good to use, uh, to do a sun razor, slow approach, not, not with the laser powered approach. I think right. we use sunlight pressure to get a lot of acceleration. Right. Yes, yes, we can get, we, we can get a, you, you can explore the interstellar media with the solar pressure, but probably not go to interstellar distances in reasonable times. I mean, you could if you just waited. Mo or what is it, uh, mote in God's eye? Yeah. 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 How and where will the RFPs come out? How do we probably find those? Come and see me. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're a private foundation. We're, yeah, yeah, so how do we get the RFP? We're a private foundation, um, so we don't have, uh, you know, Business Daily or, or any of the normal uh, distribution channels. Um, Frankly, we'd like to to get as much participation as we can, um, and come and see me or come and see Bob. Bob will love that. Um, yes, we'll post. We post them on our website. Um, but I think it's better to talk since we don't have the FAR. Since we're not a government thing, it's much better for us to have discussions and and to make sure you're on the right track and don't waste your time. But it's only a, it's only four pages, so. Um, but it's also only 150K. So we're starting slow to build to uh, a, reasonable, uh, a reasonable effort. Down there? It's about the budget pie chart. Not how much it will cost. Okay, so where, where's the pie chart for uh, funding? Uh, we think that this, uh, this effort is going to cost on the order of a CERN 
of, of $10 billion for the total effort. And we think that 60 to 80% is in, is in the photo, what we call the photon engine. Um, and that's divided between the telescopes and the lasers and the combiners. Um, so most of the most of the money is in the uh, is in the photon engine, and then uh, and Bob will talk about that. And then the rest of it is the mothership and other things. A couple of years back, there was a group called Escape Dynamics that was doing some really promising research into microwave propulsion. Um, has anybody looked into that? I know that they ended up having to shut down because they didn't have funding, but I know that they actually did. Um, a small scale, and it looked very promising, but then, I don't know if NASA picked it up afterwards or whatever, but I just know that they ended up shutting down, not because it wasn't promising, but just as you couldn't have that funding. I'm, I'm really not familiar with Escape Dynamics. Um, we've studied uh, microwave a little bit. The, the problem with microwave for interstellar work is that you need a gigantic ground, if you, if you, if you commit to ground-based, <coughs> You need a gigantic ground-based array, and we thought that that was was too expensive. Now we've been talking about doing it, uh, doing near-term tests uh, in the microwave to understand stability and to and to possibly move around the the solar system. But um, we're still studying that, so it's a good idea. But we're we're okay, still looking uh, at it. Else? Oh, yes. Yeah. Are we looking at uh, the possibility that there are natural processes which seem to exhibit the process of excess speed uh, that may give an insight into improved propulsion technologies. And in particular, I'm thinking about comets. Uh, the conventional explanation for comets is that they're somehow bumped out of the Oort cloud every now and then and they come into the inner solar system. The problem with that explanation is that uh, some groups, such as the Kreutz and Marsden groups, the sun grazers, are very frequent and directional, and also very fast, 60,000, 70,000 miles per hour. You what's follow the, the question? What's the question? The question is, are we looking at it? Is anybody considering the, the possibility we have a bad explanation for an interesting process that could give us insight into better propulsion technologies? Um, no, we're, I don't know of anybody working on that. Um, okay. And um, I would also say that the speed that comets go are very fast, but we're talking about three or four orders of magnitude faster than, than those guys. So it's a, it's a significant, uh, it's a start, yeah. Shall we move on then? Thank you.